It's a good question. Actually, that question comes oftentimes to test skepticism. Um, ordinary garden variety evil, for example, uh, can be explained away why somebody cheats on his taxes or why somebody uh, doesn't do the normal courteous things of life that you'd like them to do or somebody just comes and runs a key across your car. You know, you see that as irritants, upsetting, and in some ways maybe just why on earth does a person think of these things? But then you move into enormous evil. And so the world sits back stunned when a man can take a sharp blade and behead a human being before the eyes of millions of people and think of himself as doing good. When you see extraordinary evil, you actually have to ask the question, is evil a real category in life? Or is evil also just a case of our construct for something that we cannot explain? So skeptics oftentimes will wrestle with issues like this. Do I have a legitimate beef against God when I say that uh, I, I don't see any pattern or any good or any evil in this world? And yet there's a visceral response when he or she sees something so drastic. Then you have move into the fierce side of the question, and your question is, does there come a point at which stage you say, look, it is impossible for God to exist when I watch a sometimes genocide and other issues are brought into the question. The interesting thing about the problem of evil, and I hail from the East, I will always be an Easterner in my thinking. When you read Eastern scriptures, when you're reading the Gita, or you're reading the Mahabharata, or you read all of the corpus of Sunni material, it's vastly anecdotal, almost entirely story after story after story. The entire Gita is a story of two brothers going to war against each other and one asking the, ch the charioteer, who happens to be Krishna, but the Arjuna does know it's Krishna, asking him, how can I legitimize what I'm about to do? So, your question has to be pushed back to every worldview. Does there come a point at which Islam has to explain it? Yes. Does there come a point at which pantheism has to explain it? Yes. Does there come a point at which Judeo-Christian theism has to explain it? And when you look at the holy scriptures for the Christian, and you see a man like Habakkuk saying, I have a question for you. Why do you tolerate so much wrong? Why do you cause me to look so much injustice? Why do you just sit back and let evil abound? That was Habakkuk's opening question to God. And they felt comfortable asking this of God. So the answer generally for the skeptic is in the trilemma. God is all-powerful. God is all-loving. Evil exists. That's an incoherent set of propositions. Therefore, something has to be given up, says the skeptic. He gives up the notion of God. Yeah, that's good. Pastor, any, any any more info that you'd like to add about everything that's going on? Um, no, it's um, the, 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 and we'll probably get into it a little bit later as we just sort of discussed um, uh, what we really came here to discuss and like the meat of the matter as far as what Scripture has to say about it. But um, this type of behavior, um, as I've studied and as I've cut, sort of heard o over time, um, I, I I really didn't follow Ravi like that because most of his argumentation was of course you know everybody knows that this is a reform podcast right so we hold to a soteriology um basically the doctrines of grace right so when he would answer questions about the problem of evil it kind of turned me off because he, he never really fully answered the question he would tell right. great stories and he's a great orator he has a wonderful fantastic uh, memorization yeah. but um but you know you know that particular area of his of his theology kind of turned me off but 
you know, I, I had always heard whispers of different things going on and everything. And as I began to research, I researched the lawsuit and stuff like that. But it, it looks like sort of he had a pattern of bad works going back as far as what I've researched since 20, 2014. Hmm. Um, sort of these these um, they never really turned into scandals. Either they were lawsuits that got settled out of court or the documents were sealed and we don't really know exactly what really uh, went on. But, but I, I find it hard to believe that these signs weren't already there with the information that we know now. Um, um, but it, it seems like there was this pattern of this type of behavior of coming in, clo coming in close proximity with women or making inappropriate advances, you know, sort of, you know, receiving very inappropriate text messages from, 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 from married women and other women. Um, so there was always this underlining or this surrounding pattern. Um, and that's one of the things that, you know, when it talks about the qualifications of both the elder pastor and a deacon, you know, it talks about one who is of good report, right? Mm -hmm. Both, both from those who are outside of the church and those who are actually within the church. And so, um, and 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 that's also the danger of trying to institutionalize or to carve out this apologetic camp where they're not held or beholden to a church body, right? Right. right. Um, because when it's when it's when it's corporatized, when it's institutionalized, you know, you can't really bring to bear, you know, the nature of scripture, Matthew eighteen, restoration, Galatians six, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so so this pattern of these works that he was doing and these sort of unseemly things uh, sort of stretches back in his, in his sort of uh, behavior, according to multiple testimony of, of multiple people. 